Hello, I'm Mark Clemens and I'm a plastic surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you all today about our research at MD Anderson and specifically a disease called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Now this has uh, created a certain amount of anxiety and concern among the medical community uh, in the last two decades since it was first described in 1997 in a single case report. And even to this day, it remains incredibly rare with only a couple hundred cases ever reported. Now put that against the entire total number of breast implants in the world, which is somewhere between 15 and 20 million implants, shows that this is a very rare disease but it does occur and so I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about it, educate on it, and uh, start a discussion on this to show what we know about this disease and where we need to go to learn more about it in the future. Now what is breast implant associated ALCL? Well in 1997 a physician encountered a case and this was the very first case report. Now fast forward until about 2011 and in 2011 the FDA put out a safety communication warning about the possible association between breast implants and ALCL. Now ALCL while it is a malignancy or a cancer it is not a breast cancer and that can be confusing because it's occurring in the breast, but when we talk about breast cancer, we say that that's a disease of the breast tissue, or what we call the breast parenchyma. Now this disease seems to occur around a breast implant or in the scar capsule around the breast implant. Now because of that, we don't call it a breast cancer, but instead, based on the way it looks under a microscope, it is a disease of the immune system, which is what lymphoma is, a cancer of the immune system. The FDA has now been reported approximately 258 cases of breast implants and ALCL. Now, some of these cases were not confirmed cases, some of these cases were international cases, but based on this, the FDA estimates that there's an approximately 100 to 250 cases in the United States. The presenting symptom is usually a fluid collection occurring around the implant. This usually is a very fast onset. It can be anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, or maybe over a couple of weeks. And it's usually a very large fluid collection. In fact, some of the fluid collections we've taken out are anywhere from 300 to 500 milliliters. And that's a half a liter that suddenly, spontaneously occurs around a breast implant. Obviously, that's very concerning for a patient. And we do encourage that should this occur, this fluid collection that the patient should go to their physician to be evaluated. Now even if that occurs, the majority of the time it is not ALCL, but when ALCL does occur, that seems to be the symptom. I am commonly asked, how common is breast implant ALCL? Well, because we don't know the total number of cases, and we do rely on cases to be reported to either the FDA, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, or here at MD Anderson, we don't know the absolute total number of cases. But we do know that we have treated, here at MD Anderson, approximately 29 patients. We are tracking about 175 patients worldwide. And therefore, based on that, and also based on the total number of implants sold, that it seems to be approximately 1 in 50,000 women with breast implants. However, realize that it probably is more common as we start to find new cases. Still, that is an incredibly rare disease. Now, 
Now, if a patient actually starts to demonstrate these symptoms, we do encourage them to go back to their physician. And in this situation, the physicians then will investigate whether the patient has the disease. The way to do this is that some of that fluid that is inside of the breast needs to be drawn out or aspirated. That's usually done with a fine needle. And once that fluid is collected, it can be sent to a pathology for evaluation. And the key test that physicians are going to be performing is what's called CD30 immunohistochemistry. CD30 is a cell surface protein that's found on the surface of this disease. Now, it is true a little bit of this is found in every patient um, normally, but in these cases with this disease, there's a lot of it, tons of these cells that have this protein on their surface. And so when we perform this test, we can determine if a patient has the disease or not. Now, once we actually have a confirmed diagnosis, then we usually do a, a workup, which will include uh, performing a PET CT scan that just uh, scans the entire body looking for any other places that the disease might be. When we actually look at where this disease occurs, the majority of the time it will be around that breast implant and it seems to act locally, seems to stang just around the implant. In fact, for about 60% of patients it will be localized to that capsule or right around the implant. In another 20% of cases, it will be just outside of that capsule, but again, still in that general area. Only about one in eight patients with breast implant ALCL will actually have disease that will go to their lymph nodes. Uh, usually those are their localized lymph nodes that are right underneath the arm or right up next to their clavicle. So the clavicle, or in the armpit. And again, that's only about one in eight patients. That's the rare of the rare. Uh, sometimes they can just get an enlargement of those lymph nodes with an infection of the breast. So again, that isn't very specific to this disease, but it might be a symptom of this disease. Now with breast implant ALCL, assuming that we have a positive diagnosis and assuming that on that PET CT scan that we have the disease just around the breast implant, an important component of the treatment is surgery. And that's what we've seen from evaluating patients that were treated at MD Anderson, was that surgery is absolutely critical for the treatment. Now the surgery includes removal of the breast implant as well as that scar tissue that forms around the breast implant. Now once that is completely removed, the majority of patients tend to do quite well and that's actually curative for the majority of patients. In fact, we saw when that was performed for all stages of disease, when that was performed, it had about a recurrence rate of about 4% at one, three, and five years. That's really low compared to almost any other uh, cancers that we treat. And it just uh, points out the importance of performing surgery on these patients. Now I'm commonly asked, are there any risk factors that might put one patient at a higher risk of having the disease over another? Now we haven't found any specific risk factors, for instance, a type of patient that tends to be more prone to this. In fact, we've had some patients that have had other types of lymphomas unrelated to this, and they don't necessarily seem to have a higher risk of developing this disease. Also too, family members don't seem to be at higher risk. If a, if a sister had the disease, we haven't seen any of the siblings go on to then develop the disease. We have seen a predominance of what's called textured breast implants. For those that don't understand the surfacing of a breast implant, it can have one of two different outer shells. One is textured, which is just a rough surface that's usually used to create friction and to keep the implant in place. 
we have another type of surface that's called a smooth implant. The majority of the breast implants used in the United States over the last two decades were actually smooth implants, but a minority were textured implants. And to date, the majority of cases do seem to be related to the textured breast implants. Now, when we look at the types of patients that have been that have received breast implants, who has developed breast implant ALCL, we see an even number of cosmetic and reconstructive patients. So reconstructive for breast cancer. We see an even number. We also see an even number between silicone and saline breast implants. Realize that's what's on the inside of the implant. It only seems to be the shell or the outside of the implant that has been related to this disease. Now there's been some recent investigation by a university in Australia called Macquarie University. And this work was done by Dr. Anand Deva and he's been investigating the role of bacteria on the surface of a breast implant and that's um, a phenomenon called biofilm when you can actually have bacteria on a breast implant but it doesn't actually cause an infection. It's what's described as subclinical. It doesn't actually cause a cellulitis. It's not causing an infection. But it can live there, kind of dormant, uh, protected, if you will, from the immune system. Now, you can imagine over enough years, if the immune system can somehow see that and cause a low-grade inflammatory reaction between the uh, immune system, then if stimulated long enough, the hypothesis is that then the immune system or those T cells could then become uh, cancer like we see in breast implant ALCL. These theories are compelling. Um, they're some of the leading theories that are going on right now and we're still investigating that both in our laboratory at MD Anderson as well as in Dr. Deva's laboratory in Australia and that likely uh, we'll have more information on that in the coming years. I'm commonly asked, are there other treatments that are needed for breast implant ALCL? When we look at all the patients that have gotten this disease, there is a high proportion of them that have received chemotherapy. Now at this time, if the disease is completely surgically excised, we don't specifically see a role for chemotherapy, but it's very important that that decision is made by a multidisciplinary team. Patients that develop this disease are seen by uh, a plastic surgeon, by a oncologist, uh, ideally specializing in lymphoma, as well as a surgical oncologist. That's a type of physician that actually removes or cuts out uh, cancer. And also to a pathologist, ideally a hematopathologist, which specializes in lymphoma. All of these, uh, all of these people are specialists in their field and also uh, can best give uh, suggestions about the best way to treat this disease. And so any decision for uh, treatment with chemotherapy or radiation therapy should be made by this multidisciplinary team just to make sure that the disease is, be is treated to the best ability that it can be. So those are the basics of breast implant ALCL. I've gone through some of the symptoms that can occur. I've gone through the background and the history, as well as the treatment of the disease and how we actually investigate it within the body. Now also too, we've talked about the prognosis, which is very good, but it is very important that when patients develop this symptoms, that they actually go to their doctor. Many times we see with cosmetic patients where they may feel that they paid for those breast implants out of their pocket, that any relationship with something going wrong, they would have to pay for it out of their pocket again. Realize that this is completely separated from that. If a, if a patient had a problem with a breast implant and it was in a poor position or needed another surgery for a revision, that's different. This is actually working up the patient for suspicion of a cancer. And therefore, insurance does cover this procedure. It covers the investigation as well as the treatment if it is a confirmed case. Now, I know we haven't had that much time today, so if you're looking for additional information on this disease, I would turn you to, first, 
the FDA's uh, information web portal on the subject of breast implant ALCL. They have very good information for physicians as well as for patients. And it talks about how much the FDA knows and where the future of research will go from here. I would also direct uh, patients as well as physicians to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons website. Now this website has information not only about breast implant ALCL, but also how to report confirmed cases. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons has a collaboration with the FDA in creating what's called the Profile Registry. That's a very good word for anybody who's interested in breast implant ALCL, is the Profile Registry. The Profile Registry prospectively collects and tracks these patients. And it can be found at the following website. And finally, I would also direct uh, patients to come to the MD Anderson Cancer Center website. We have a website that we've designed uh, that specifically addresses all the information about breast implant ALCL, talks about the background, the diagnosis, and the management of confirmed cases. We, have we expect a lot more information to come out over the next couple of years as further research defines who is at risk and how we can prevent a single further one of these cases from occurring. Thank you for your attention today, and I look forward to further discussions. Thank you.